Holy Bowler the John Blanchard Story is presented by K. Toots Favreau. Additional underwriting support provided by Joseph C. and Sue Ellen Canizero and the Wally Pontiff Jr. Foundation. New Orleans, city of spirits, where souls have their own addresses and saints of all kinds are celebrated. Here, boy becomes man, tragedy turns to triumph, and the road less traveled might just be a bowling lane. Faith lights every path, even the unexpected, as a beacon of hope, a miracle in the darkest of storms. God subtly intervenes in our lives and places the right people in our lives, places the right circumstances in our lives, or gives us a sign, not an apparition, but a sign that he is truly present. My father's, uh, he's someone that believes in signs, and he's taught us to believe in uh, the little nuggets that God's putting in front of you. I really think that that sums him up. Well, pre-Medjugorje, they always lived by faith, but post Medjugorje, I believe he had more guts to take some chances, knowing that he would be taken care of. This is the story of one man's journey that started with a pilgrimage across the globe and ended up down a lane. With the Blessed Mother leading the way, this kingpin created an institution known the world over and saved his family in the process. It is a life filled with small miracles. The story of a devoted father, son, and the mother who loves him. My family did not come from Nothing. wealthy people. I mean, they, 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 they had some uh, very tough financial times. My mother grew up uh, in a divorced family when there was no other divorced children in the school. They missed that male figure. And when I was the first born male child, I was kind of preceded by them. This kid has to be the ticket out of here. From the very beginning, John Blanchard felt a profound responsibility to take care of others. First, his family of origin, then his own wife and children. And he knew somehow he had to get moving. There was a time when we were living in Metairie and we were moving into New Orleans. I put my house up for sale before the house in New Orleans was ready. And I didn't have a house to move into, so I moved in with my grandmother. I would come home late at night. I would hear my grandmother praying the rosary. The only one I, I kept hearing her name, please help my son John take care of the family. At the time, Blanchard did whatever necessary to keep his family fed, from modeling to selling silver to selling crawfish, and sometimes all in the same afternoon. Originally, John's life plan centered around baseball, a promising player throughout childhood and high school, John was awarded a scholarship to Loyola University. Baseball was a, a thread that ran you know, from my dad to myself, from me to my son, and now my son to my grandson. I went to Loyola. Everything that I'd always dreamed about was kind of coming true. Then all of a sudden, Loyola announced that they were dropping athletics. Got a couple of letters from a couple of teams. I went to Northwest Louisiana, and I was there two weeks when I met my wife in the school cafeteria. Two and a half years later, we were married, and three and a half to that, my son was born, and two more years later, my, my daughter was born. That bad break that I had, when I look back, and th at the time, being completely devastated, uh, really, in retrospect, it was, you know, I guess the, the most greatest blessing of my life, and the fact that I met my wife, you look beautiful. <laughs> Red faced. Baseball dreams were put aside. With a growing young family and extended family for whom he felt responsibility, John set about finding his fortune. Problem was, nothing would stick. In 1988, when I went to Medjugorje, I was uh, down on my luck and my family was having problem. My father was uh, had retired and went into real estate. He lost everything that he had. My mother worked for a doctor and the doctor retired so she was out of work and then my sister was separated and 
she and the, her two children moved in with my mom and dad. And I just felt as the oldest son that I was that person to try to take care of things. And I was having trouble just taking care of myself and my immediate family. When I went there, I, I thought, I said, well, maybe if I see something, if I see some visions, that then I would come back wanting to share my faith. And my experience was that I saw no visions. I saw nothing supernatural whatsoever, except I saw people's lives change. Lots of folks went to Magigoria asking for big miracles, healing and the like, but not John. When I was on a mountain, I did ask for something to take care of my family. And uh, I was back one week when somebody said, John, you want to hear a business deal? When John came back from Magigoria, I would say that he was a little bit more at peace with himself. And you could tell that Medjugorje had a profound effect. And Mary was the focus. One of my partners came up to me one day and said, do you know anybody who might want a bowling alley? A short time thereafter, I ran into John. And I said, a bowling alley? I don't know anything about bowling. And I said, where? And they said, the old mid-city bowling lanes. And I said, in that neighborhood? You gotta be crazy. A couple of weeks later, I started to think about it. I said, you know, I asked for something. Let me look into this. The, the only prayer I kept saying was, Blessed Mother, this is only if that's what you want me to do. I don't wanna buy a bowling alley. I know I asked, you know, on the mountain in Medjugorje, you know, would you please send me something that I can get my whole family involved in and make a living and take care of them all. The only person that knew why I was doing it was my wife. So with the blessed mother and wife Deborah on his side, John made an incredibly low offer, $1,000 down and a $9,000 note payable over 10 years. To get that offer accepted would take, well, a miracle. They were paying $1,500 a month in rent, and they had lost $50,000, so I offered them half the rent, and they told me no. So I think the deal's dead. And then uh, October 26th, the landlord calls and says, look, we'll make a deal the first year for $750, but after that, it goes back to the $1,500. So again, I'm saying, blessed mother, I hope, I hope this is what you want me to do. And I ended up taking over at 12.01, All Saints Day, 1988, I, I took over the old Mid-City Bowling Lanes. It was such a work in progress. It was all hands on deck, and it was a daily evolving adventure. We would just live in it day by day. So when you live something like that, I don't know if you necessarily think, oh wow, we were too busy giving out the shoes, cooking the okra, and pouring the beer. But when I first took over the bowling alley, uh, there was a theater across the street from me, and a, a few of the actors and actresses came over to the bowling alley uh, after rehearsals and were bowling. And they asked me if it was okay to jump on the bar and dance. Before I knew it, the whole cast was around this horseshoe bar, and they would just stay up there dancing to every song in a jukebox the entire night. The word spread at rehearsals and backstage, and after the curtain fell, cast would head to the place where they could gather after they got off stage to sing and dance, to rock and bowl. Momentum was building, just not fast enough. And after a couple of months of living payroll to payroll, the game was almost over before it began. First month and a half, I was just, just you know, basically getting by, trying to figure out how I, I'm going to get to the next payroll. The Mid City Neighborhood Association, I gave them the bowling alley on that first Saturday night I was there. I didn't make any money, but I was trying to get people in the neighborhood to realize that I was there, maybe bring some families in. There was a fellow in the group that wrote a, a sectional for the Times Picayune, but he said, Would you mind if I interviewed you? about you taking over this bowling alley and being in the bowling business. A couple of weeks later, he called John, man, I'm sorry, he says, but the editor turned it down. They're not, they're not taking a story. Running out of money and with a dream not gaining traction, 
He was down to his last $2,000 with payroll looming. On December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Plancher again turned to the Blessed Mother. My dad said, you know, son, you have to get out of this. This is impossible. I mean, uh, you're gonna die here. I walked out of there that, not that night and I stopped at the all night vigil at St. Clement of Rome Church. And I knelt down there beneath the picture of the Blessed Mother and said, Blessed Mother, you have to help me get out of this. But I just happened to just stay on for one more week, two more weeks. And right after Christmas, Ed called me and said, John, he says, uh, the editor just called me and said, uh, they're gonna run the story. Another small miracle. The fledgling business went from 60 games to 600 bold in one night. And so for the first time, John witnessed the power of the media. And the city at large became aware of this new place with a nostalgic twist. The buzz had begun about rock and bowl. The theater crowd went up there and I put the jukebox on and I said, let's rock and bowl. Rock and bowl will never die. It's old New Orleans, my oh my. Come on, baby, let's go rock and bowl at the city lane. Oh, my, let's bowl, let's rock and roll. Baby, do the rock and bowl. At I can't swear that I was the first person to ever say that, but once I said it, they just continued to catch on, you know, from there. And soon they were coming to dance at the Rock and Bowl from all around. I'm in the bowling alley one evening, and these five Buddhist monks come up the steps. They have an interpreter because they, they don't speak English. Monks, part of their whole religion is experiencing everything at least once and uh, they've never bowled can they bowl and I said sure and he says you know they don't wear shoes I said that's okay I said that's, that's not a problem here so I said look I'm not gonna charge you just I put two lanes on and I let them you know go out and start bowling and it was pretty hilarious because they, they didn't know a thing about bowling and they were throwing two arms and they were throwing it from here down the lanes and their, their saffron robes. Seems everyone was getting enlightened and drawn to mid-city lanes. There was bowling and food, and the next logical step, live music. And I told people when I, when I first took over the, uh, the mid-city bowling lanes, I really did think it was the greatest catering hall. John's vision looked like this. You can have a band, and you can have food and drink, and you can bowl. When he told folks his plan, most of them looked at him like he had a third eye, especially his dad. But there was one true believer. My best friend, my late friend, Louis Nugent, proclaimed himself the head of a Mardi Gras crew. It was sort of a mock crew called the Crew of Mother Rue. Nobody else thought it was a good idea until Louis walked in that day and he tells my daddy, this is the greatest catering hall in a city. You could put a band right over here, you got the food and a drink, and you can bowl. So in the first of many, the annual ball of the crew of Mother Roo was booked for Endymion Saturday, 1989. An elegant evening of all-you-can-drink draft beer, king cake, and one more thing, live music. An important first for the bowling alley. Everybody's in there, and all of a sudden, the brass band comes up the steps and a limousine pulls up in front of the bowling alley. These guys come out, they pull a coffin out, they carry the coffin up the steps. They put the coffin in front of the band, band member opens it up and the guy sits up and he starts singing all dead singer songs. Uh, two hours later, he gets back in the coffin, the brass band comes up and they carry the, the coffin, put it in the back of the hearse, and the hearse pulls off in the bowling alley. Everybody had a great time, and after that party, people started calling me about just doing parties. This is a good place to have a good time. In the summer of 1991, we heard that there was something interesting going on at this old bowling alley here in New Orleans. 
Sure enough, there was a scene developing, and I think part of it was just the novelty of like, hey, look, we're dancing at a bowling alley. But it was also uh, a feel in the room that derived from John Blanchard. You know, John was the host of this party. John's party was the place to be for everyone from regular yets to bowling stone. The chauffeur came to the door and asked who was playing. And he tells Sherry that he has the Rolling Stones and they want to come in. And she said, how many people? He said, seven. She said, $35. And he said to her, you're going to charge the Rolling Stones to come in? And she just turned around and said, without a problem, is he going to charge me to go into his concert Monday night? It became a very important gig for a lot of musicians across the spectrum. Um, they could depend on a crowd showing up at Rock and Bowl. So it became a place where older musicians, veteran musicians who really didn't have a lot of other gigs could find steady work and draw a crowd and have a nice paycheck. And it also kind of became a proving ground for younger bands. What John Blanchard did, he gathered most of the relevant artists to the New Orleans culture and he put them all in his venue they were able to get a brand new following of fans. And the fact that I was able at 13 to be able to say, hey, I played at the Rock and Roll and I built up a career. I still play here, you know, every couple of months. That somebody like John really believed in, in me. And he proves that belief is sometimes all that you need and that something really great can blossom from that belief. At the time, Rock and Roll just came on our radar. Johnny Blanchard gave us an opportunity. And uh, I remember we packed it out that first time we were in there. Probably one of our biggest rock and roll crowds ever was probably the first time we played there. You didn't necessarily have to know who was playing to want to go to rock and roll. You sometimes went to rock and roll just to go to rock and roll. But on the flip side of that, yeah, people started showing up specifically to hear certain bands. Including a National Geographic photographer who wandered in for a pool boy and left with a story. When it comes out in January of 95, all of a sudden, USA Today does a story in February, CNN does a story in March, Life Magazine did a story in April, Southern Living did a story in May, Rolling Stone Magazine did a story in June, the NBC Today Morning Show came and did a story in July, and all of a sudden, I'm a national attraction, and I'm one of the, if you come to New Orleans, one of the things you need to do is go to the bowling alley and go to the rock and bowl. With recognition came success and the opportunity to become his own landlord. Renovation soon began on the new Ye Old College Inn. So the little bowling alley turned catering hall turned honky tonk revived some careers and launched others, all while sustaining a family and answering a prayer. Things were really rolling until Katrina rolled in. The bowling alley itself, it's an, another miraculous thing. The tornado hit right out my back door of the, of the bowling alley. Truthfully, the bowling alley was the only thing in that neighborhood that was not damaged. From August 29th, I had 120 days to get open or my lease was no longer valid. Without power, Blanchard was out of business. The clock was ticking. All of the electrical supply houses in the city were in New Orleans East, and New Orleans East was, was, was destroyed worse than anyone. My uh, brother-in-law, he knew some people in the electrical supply business in, in Acadiana. Working between New Orleans and their post-Katrina base in Lafayette, a relay began. This went on for weeks. Then came the next hurdle, getting the power turned back on. With flooded cars and debris still filling the streets, the city's answer was a resounding no. By that time, there became an awareness that if they did not get businesses back up, that they were never going to, going to get the population to come back into the city. They said, if you finish the panels, if it passes inspection, if Auntie G agrees to hook you up. We'll agree to give you the license. On October 26th, the electrician called me and said, John, the panels are ready. The city, they were out in one hour. They said, you passed inspection. 
call it entity. They were out 30 minutes after that, and I had power. To get that kind of cooperation in the city <laughs> at that time was a miracle. Another miracle. The lights were on, but who would come? Who was even in the city? And how do you reach them? John turned to his old friend, the media. I called Keith Spira, who was the writer for the Times Picayune. He wrote something that I was opening on that Thursday. And then uh, Eric Paulson with WWL The Morning Show said, look, we got word the Rock and Bowl's opening tonight. It took people like John Blanchard to show that New Orleans was still alive. We were back. And the Rock and Bowl was one of those things that was just typically New Orleans that, that had to come back and did come back. That first night, we had 750 people, and people were hugging one another for like five minutes at a time. And when they walked in and they could see nothing has really changed here, I really think that that's when you know, Rock and Bull became just recognized as a piece of New Orleans that is here, that is immutable, unchangeable in their lives. The very next day, word spread. Rock and Bowl became the place to meet family and friends. The place where you could exhale and say, we will not be washed away. College Inn was already under construction. And through a seemingly unfortunate turn of events, contents of the short-lived Bowl Me Under had been moved to College Inn for storage. Two weeks before the storm, what would have been lost in the flood stayed high and dry. I would have lost all these coolers. I'd have lost all my murals. I mean, everything down there, I brought over here. And I have it raised up because I'm beginning to build another restaurant. So when Katrina hits, I'm halfway there. Post-Katrina, Rock and Bowl was the first business open on Carrollton Avenue, from Claiborne to Lake Pontchartrain. Three months later, there were only four businesses open on that same stretch, and John owned two of them. We are a blessed family. We're not lucky. We do work hard. We're blessed. Katrina was, was devastating to so many. At the same time, Katrina uh, was a great blessing to me. I, I was able to reinvent myself and reinvent my businesses. And I had people that all of a sudden that may never have come here before. Before long, both businesses were located on the same block at the corner of Carrollton and Earhart. The purchase of land made way for the urban farm, which supplies fresh produce for both Rock and Bowl and College Inn. But this urban Eden also serves a higher purpose. You know, we bought a lot and then bought another lot, and I said, this is perfect because I can lay it out in the Stations of the Cross. When we first did the stations, we had a, a couple of guys from the seminary come over and lead us. And when I turned around after we were done, I counted it all up. And I realized when I got back to myself, we were 12. I said, well, that's a sign. And I, I hollered at him. I said, there'll be more next year. Now it's been going for many years. And I don't know, we may have had 300 people this past Good Friday. It, it, I, I don't know how many. It, I stopped counting. It's wonderful. Some might say, while feeding the soul is the highest calling, nourishing body and spirits comes right after. A quirky neighborhood hangout before Katrina, Ye Old College Inn has been reinvented under the Blanchers as a white tablecloth neighborhood hangout. It's also a place where Blancher honors the city's sports legend. Another lesson of Katrina was that Lafayette and New Orleans shared an appreciation of Catholicism. What better way to repay the hospitality they'd been shown during the evacuation than to open a new location in Lafayette. Rock and Bowl de Lafayette and its restaurant, the Sainte Marie, opened on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Well, as the family has grown, we need to create more opportunities inside the business uh, so that they have the opportunity to be here if they choose to. And to, you know, to continue to grow means that there's 
more cities in the future. There's more rock and bowls. Where exactly is the number three going to be? I don't know yet. I think we're going to take the approach of one step at a time and let, let God take care of leading us into what it should be. So what's it like when dad is your boss and business partner? How would you describe the old man's philosophy? We were taught faith from very little. You know, have faith that God will provide and God will take care of us. And that's how they've lived their lives. And that's how they've taught us to live ours. There's not a job around here that an employee does that him or I or Johnny have never done ourselves. Although he's a father-in-law and, and a friend, I still consider him a boss. You know, this is his show. I mean, having dad as a business partner is the perfect partner. I don't think that anyone loves you more than your father and your mother. Being business partners is, is natural. From the very beginning, through victories and tribulations, there's always been a constant daily reminder to remain humble and focused on the source of every blessing and the importance of praying it forward. Miracles happen in our daily lives with people intervening. That's God being with us, walking with us, accompanying us. And God does that and says basically two things. I am with you. And then secondly, do not be afraid. I will lead you. The rosary is such a powerful prayer. I think that that's probably been the greatest thing that I ever got out of my mother and father's trips to Medjugorje was that they brought that back to our family. The loving mother, I mean, I, I don't know who doesn't need one of those. John and I have taken our cue from our grandparents. We don't let a day go by where we don't pray for our children and our grandchildren. We always make sure that we pray for their physical, spiritual, and emotional lives. Prayer is so important. It works. It's obvious. How else do you explain a National Geographic reporter who wanders in the front door looking for lunch and launches an avalanche of interest across the globe? You know, that's one of those like, miracles we've been talking about, that this guy gets sent to New Orleans and he gets turned away from four places to end up in my place, writes about me, all of a sudden, you know, I'm a national, international location. Once a sleepy little upstairs bowling alley of the 1940s to an entertainment destination that survived many a storm, Blanchard's vision is realized in a place that feels like home, where they dance Zydeco, say the rosary, and celebrate Louisiana joie de vie, all thanks, he believes, to the blessed mother who loves him. She has never stopped sending people to my businesses telling the story. I mean, she is the reason why this place has become what it has been. The blessed mother is the greatest PR person a businessman can have. When I see children playing baseball in the spring I felt the spirit in the air I felt concern and felt the care And I felt the love of Jesus Christ our King Yes, I felt the love of Jesus Christ our King Holy Bowler, The John Blanchard Story is presented by K. Toots Favreau. Additional underwriting support provided by Joseph C. and Sue Ellen Canizero and the Wally Pontiff Jr. Foundation.